welcome to the Ball and Breakfast podcast. Uh, thanks for joining us again. We recently posted a, an Eastern Conference uh, NBA kind of rundown of, of what's going to happen this week in the playoffs. Um, fresh on YouTube. Uh, go there, check it out. If you want, leave us a comment. Let us know what you think of our predictions. Plug any teams that you think are going to come out of the East this year. Um, or if you just want to stick to the first round, just you know, let us know about an upset or, or what have you. Um, you know, we're really starting to build momentum here, <laughs> publishing content, getting things rolling. Um, you know, if you're on Apple, leave us a review. If you're on YouTube, you know, subscribe to our channel. Instagram, we're firing, firing away stuff, you know, by the day. And uh, we have Linktree, uh, you know, linked in our bio. So just go there. You'll find where all of our content is located, whether it's video, audio. And, uh, you know, we just really appreciate any support you may be able to provide. Um as for tonight's episode, we're gonna we're gonna move over to the Western Conference. Uh, there is a game scheduled for tonight between the the Pelicans and Spurs. So we're we're you know recording this before the game goes live. So so trust in us that we're you know giving you some accurate you know, predictions here. But uh, I guess just looking at the landscape of where things are, um, you know the one through six seeds right now in the West are are locked. It's the Phoenix Suns at the number one, Memphis Grizzlies, Golden State Warriors. Dallas Mavericks, Utah Jazz, and the Denver Nuggets. And then we have two play-in tournament games, uh, the seven-seed Minnesota Timberwolves versus the Los Angeles Clippers at the eight-seed. Um, in the nine-seed, we have the New Orleans Pelicans against the number 10-seed San Antonio Spurs. Uh, we covered this in the Eastern Conference video, but just so you know, the play-in tournament goes that there's going to be a one-game playoff between the seven and eight-seeds and the nine and 10-seeds. The winner of the 7-8 matchup is the number seven seed. The loser of that will play the winner of the nine and 10 seed game. And then the winner of that game will be uh, declared the eight seed for the Western Conference. And then we'll you know, begin a traditional 18 playoff. But before we dive into the teams and, and you know, our predictions, I just first wanna ask Wayne, uh, what do you think of the play-in tournament um, in general, this new in innovation for the game and uh, you know, what it could mean for other sports? Uh, in, you know, in that sense too. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I've always been a fan of kind of like, I, I think a lot of uh, uh, professional organizations are now trying to capture some of that March madness uh, type of uh, craziness, right? Where one game can cause a snowball effect. Uh, so, you know, I, I, as a fan, I, I like it. Um, I think it does add in some value when you're a fringe team, kind of like, oh, I'd like to have a chance in the playoffs. And, you know, it would be, it would be fantastic if, say, like a team like, you know, the Spurs at the 10th seed could make a run for it, right? Like, how crazy would that be? You know, um, so I think it's good for the game and good for the fans, I think, overall. Um, you know, is it maybe great for the players, especially if you're a top team? It's like, oh, okay, great, one more game to play or something like that. But, um, in the end of the day, I think, you know, the fans want to see good basketball. And, you know, if you're a 10th seed team that has, you know, maybe had a bad um, beginning of the season, but, you know, through injuries or something like that, and then all of a sudden you start picking up momentum, then I think it's good for the game, good for, you know, those kinds of teams too. So, yeah, as an NBA fan, I like it. Um, uh, but at the same time, I know I can understand like the players being like, ah, more, more games, more waiting time and all that but yeah how do you feel about it i like it to an extent i mean i think it gives a, a proper dopamine hit right before the playoffs starts <laughs> sure. you know, like two matchups and then one matchup to to kind of seal everything else and you know like you're saying with the uh march madness bracket i mean that's that's really carried the torch i think for um really how playoffs should feel or how it, you know tournament should be set it just has that kind of uh intrigue on a game by game basis and you know, I, I think it, it serves a good purpose. I think one edit I would make is, and I kind of feel this way about sports and playoffs in general, but mm -hmm. if there's a team that's under 500 or, or more teams that are under 500 that, that get a chance to play in, I think those teams should just be eliminated. I, I think, I think it'd be <laughs> fair to say like, hey, look at the Eastern yeah. Conference. There's 10 teams that were 500 or better. Let's look at the Western Conference. There's only eight. And then these last two are, yeah. you know, Maybe there's like some some things you could create where it's like, you know, I'm sorry, uh, you know, uh, Philadelphia Eagles for, for being seven and nine this one season. Like you don't make the playoffs. Like, unfortunately, right. you got to be 500 or better. But 
Um, in any case, uh, you know, I'll leave it there, but I uh, yeah, just wanted to kind of throw that out there. Yeah, I know for sure. And one more thing to add on there, like I've always been more of a fan of like uh, kind of getting rid of the conferences a little bit, or at least divisions when it comes to some of that. It's like, you know, if you're in a really crappy uh, division and you, you mashed 500 or something like that, it's like, do you really deserve like the fourth seed or third seed or something just based off that? I don't think so. I think it ought to be more so on your overall record uh, from there. So yeah, especially with all the, you know, home field advantage, I think it's definitely something to, to call out, you know, for the NBA. So, but yeah, I, I can definitely see that point of view for sure. Yeah, I'd agree with that. It seems, especially in the NBA that the the divisions don't really matter all that much. I mean, for football, I feel like it, it's pretty clear that they have to play each other twice and they don't play any other teams twice. So winning your division actually matters, but yeah, yeah it just kind of, it makes no sense once you kind of get to the actual, uh, you know, bracket, you know, set up and everything like that. And it's like, did those division titles actually mean anything? Right. Yeah, for sure. So, um, so I guess I'll just leave it there. Um, but let's dive into the play on, you know, the play in turn in general and the matchups coming up. Uh, let's start with tonight's matchup. Yeah. Um, how do you feel um, with the Pelicans and Spurs playing at the nine and 10 seeds? Yeah, no, this is actually a, a, you know, I was reading up more on the teams and just kind of seeing like how they were progressing th- during their seasons and everything. Like, um, I think it's a really cool matchup. Uh, I'll definitely try to be watching after <laughs> after this for sure. But, you know, uh, DeJounte Murray, like, you know, I, I knew he was battling through some sickness. So I think he was kind of doubtful or maybe not doubtful, but there's questions if he might participate for tonight. It looks like he might be playing. So, you know, I just don't see them Spurs, to be honest, winning if Murray isn't playing uh, just because of what he means for the team. And then, you know, they don't have as much ammunition, I think, all around. Um, and especially with the way that the Spurs play uh, and how they play to their potential, they're very much a pace, uh, a pace and space more so team uh, these days. And DeJounte Murray is just great at that and, and being a playmaker. So, you know, if he's playing great, but I might, I think overall, uh, I just think that the New Orleans Pelicans uh, with Ingram, uh, with McCollum, um, and then Jonas uh, Valachunas, I think that you know, those three players are, are really solid staples for them that I don't think the Pelicans have a match for. So in this matchup, I'm going to go with the, the Pelicans uh, as, as much of a, you know, I'd like to see the Spurs kind of like, you know, resurrect themselves after this, uh, you know, Tim Duncan era. I, I just don't see it, um, them going that far this year at least. So, um, but with that being said, you know, the Spurs, uh, I'm glad that they're getting some, some sunlight, I think, in this, uh, in this playoffs. So, yeah. No, I, I mean, I think that those are all fair points. I was actually just taking a look at whether or not Murray was going to be active tonight. And it kind of, uh, it's a little cloudy. It seems like there could yeah. be some gamesmanship here. So, uh, you know, I think your caveats um, are, are fair um, just as far as the Spurs go. Um, I wanted to do a little digging in with the New Orleans Pelicans. So I kind of pulled up what happened after the CJ McCollum trade because you know, it's a completely different team when you bring in a guy of his caliber and kind of seeing how they went. Um, and it was around February uh, 9th where that kind of started. Um, since the time they were acquired McCollum, they've been 14 and 14, which is pretty average. Um, Spurs have also been 14 and 14 over that same stretch. So it's kind of like I kept looking at different areas in which these teams kind of you know, could be, could be, you know, one better than the other. And I think what I'm ultimately coming to is, you know, without Zion Williamson, um, which is another conversation probably for another day, um, you know, just out in general. And, you know, I've heard that Brandon Ingram might be a game time decision tonight too with the Pelicans. I kind of just looked at, you know, how are these rosters constructed and, and uh, which one would I have more confidence in, you know, in a game like tonight and uh, you know, it is one game, but I'm, I'm going to actually go with the Spurs in this one. Um, you know, they've got Murray, they've got um, Vassal, they've got, you know, Kelton Johnson, um, Jacob Podol. They've got a decent bench. It's like, I just feel like they have a little bit more depth and they have guys that probably can guard, you know, multiple positions. Whereas the Pelicans to me feel kind of, you know, five deep at this point. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I think, you know, McCollum's a great scorer. Uh, Jonas Valanciunas has had a career year, you know, being the full-time center there. He's probably been, you know, their MVP over the course of the, of the season. But um, it just feels like, 
you know, if, if Ingram's not at full strength and, you know, no Zion and you're kind of going up against Greg Popovich, who's been there and done it. I just kind of have this gut instinctual feeling that they might, you know, knock him off tonight. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no. And I was, I was definitely on the brink of this. I think I switched back and forth. So, uh, several times I think, uh, but yeah, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to stand firm on my Pelicans pick. Uh, but yeah, like I said, I like the way that the Spurs, uh, play overall. And then, uh, Greg Popovich, it's like, it's always hard to, uh, kind of go against him there. So, but yeah, I'm going to go against you here and, uh, pick, pick the Pelicans and see, see if they can do it without Zion for sure. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, so we're a good split there. Um, how about in the seven and eight matchup between the, uh, the Timberwolves and the Clippers? Yeah, no, this is a good one too. I, I, I kind of got split on this a little bit too. Um, again, going back and forth, uh, you know, with the Clippers, uh, you know, more of a veteran squad, you know, with, uh, Timberwolves, definitely much more of, uh, a younger up and coming team more so of with some, you know, with D'Angelo Russell and Towns, um, who I think, I think Russell might've played in the playoffs before and in Towns for one season. So, you know, not totally new, but, um, you know, I guess there as a, as kind of an organization for, you know, at least the past several years, just not used to that winning, uh, attitude or that winning, uh, 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 that winning culture yet. Um, and with the Clippers, they've definitely have battled injuries. Uh, and who knows, I think this is the, this is definitely the, the thing I've been thinking about is like, which, which Paul George are we going to see? Are we going to see playoff P or are we going to see pandemic P, right? I, <laughs> you have to see which one shows up. If it's playoff P, it's hard to go against a good playoff P um, in the playoffs uh, with the, you know, just with the, the assets that the Clippers have right now, even without, um, even without Kawhi Leonard. So, and uh, I think possibly also Luke Kennard as well. So, if that's the case, you know, if playoff P shows up, you know, I don't think that the Minnesota Timberwolves have anything to uh, to that to counter that really. Um, so in in my pick for this, and again, I went back and forth. I think at the final second, um, you know, as much as, as I'd like to see Pat Beverly get you know get that chip on his shoulder against the Clippers, his former team, and all that, I am actually gonna have to go with the Clippers in this one. Um, you know, I, I think the Clippers are just a better defensive team, Minnesota, you know, like I said, they're still young. Um, I think that, you know, uh, Anthony Edwards, it, it's great that he made some strides, uh, I think this year, but I, I don't think it's his time yet. I think they'll all probably take a ne- a ne- their next step probably next season. Uh, but I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to go with the Clippers here. I think we see a decent Paul George outing. Um, and then they have, you know, some other assets too, to help out with, uh, the scoring load. Um, and I, I think that with Batum, between Batum, George, and Mann, they'll hold off on the on Anthony Edwards going off, uh, as well as some of their other players too. So, yeah, going with the Clippers in this one. So, yeah, what's your take? No, I, I, I'm going right with you. Um, you know, kind of looking at some recent matchups that they've had, I mean, they've act, like absolutely obliterated the Milwaukee Bucks, uh, the Thunder, which, you know, isn't the biggest victory, but still, I mean, putting them away by 40 plus points is still notable in the last game of the year. Mm -hmm. Uh, They knocked off the Suns, you know, in a, in a tight matchup uh, recently. And it's just, you know, kind of looking down the line, it's, it's, it's uh, who's going to be, you know, the, the savior tonight. And uh, you know, Robert Covington's had a big, you know, breakout game and Norman Powell as well. And then it's, you know, um, you know, kind of looking down that line, I mean, Reggie Jackson's had a solid year the entire year and, and, you know, you're naming off, you know, obviously Paul George and, you know, man and others, but it's like, they have a new hero every single night and, mm-hmm. um, you know, they've been playing pretty hot, you know, lately. And I'm kind of with you with the wolves. I mean, I like the names and I like, you know, how they've come together this year. Um, you know, towns, Russell, you know, Beverly and, um, you know, Anthony Edwards watching him kind of break out and, you know, I like that he's like for Minnesota too. It's pretty rare that you get guys who are like in a, you know, grandstand and be, you know, waving a flag for Minnesota, but it's like kind of bringing some pride back to that franchise, which, you know, has really needed it, um, you know, over the last couple of decades, um, Mm -hmm. you know, especially since KG left, but, um, you know, I still think the Wolves are a good team. I just kind of, you know, I feel like Clippers going to, you know, come in with that experience, come in with that comfort and just, you know, take care of business, um, you know, with their, their strength and numbers. Yeah, for sure. No, yeah. I mean, 
Uh, again, I was torn. I think I switched in the last second. I think I even marked Minnesota on my list here. But no, I, after thinking about it, yeah, I think it's the Clippers. Um, you know, and I, I think one thing for me that's you know, that kind of solidified a little bit it, is you know I I I'm, I'm just not seeing Towns going off for one, but then also his defense defense and down low and you know um, uh, just Minnesota's defense in general. So that's where I see like. The Clippers, you know, again, in the playoffs, you got to have a good defensive team to to move forward. So that's where I see the Clippers and their veteran experience just kind of taking over. So, yeah, I think that's pretty fair. Um, so I guess that would set you up in your eighth seed for a Wolves Pelican uh, Pelicans matchup. What do you think that's going to you know, uh, turn out to be? Yeah, Wolves versus Pelicans. Uh, I think that's a that's that, that'll be a fun matchup, I think. Um, ah. You know, the Pelicans definitely have somewhat of a veteran presence for sure. Um, but then, you know, the Wolves, they, they, that, that youthful exuberance, you know, uh, if, if there is a team that I'm like, maybe they, they could u- utilize more veteran presence and then that should help stabilize, I think, their, uh, their culture, their locker room, and then, you know, the team in general. I, it would definitely be the Wolves, I think. Uh, maybe not Jimmy Butler. But, you know, somebody, somebody that, that has a little bit of moxie there, I think could definitely benefit them. Um, I'll probably go with the Wolves. I'll probably go with the Wolves. I think they just have, you know, maybe a little too much talent, uh, you know, offensively uh, compared to, you know, what the Pelicans have to offer. Um, that being said, I think you mentioned before, like, Valachunas, he's been kind of their MVP. So if he can, you know, kind of muscle out Towns, uh, then, you know, then I think they, have, they stand a good chance for sure. Uh, but, you know, they don't have Zion. They don't have, you know, some other assets like that uh, versus the Wolves who are uh, pretty much healthy overall. Uh, and, you know, I, I think, you know, getting defeated by the Clippers maybe might be a nice, like, okay, this is the playoffs. Maybe we uh, ought to, you know, focus more, get things together a little bit more. So I'll go with the Wolves for this one now. I, I agree too. In my matchup, it'd be the Wolves versus the Spurs. I just think they're going to get, yeah, maybe kicked in the teeth a little bit by the Clippers. That'll wake them up. Um, you know, they want, want want to have this year be remembered as a year where they were, you know, penciled in for the seventh seed and then ultimately didn't make the playoffs. So I think they just have, you know, a little bit too much backbone. And, uh, you know, I just I can't see a, a guy like Pat Beruli you know, <laughs> not being able to rally up. Uh, you know, Russell has been around the block. Towns who, you know, needs to get in the playoffs. He needs to... Yeah. You know, get that experience and really, you know, start to establish himself, you know, whether he's going to be a longtime Timberwolf or, you know, uh, a guy who joins another super team down the line, but it's just like, it's his time. And, uh, you know, it's not the Spurs time in my mind. I think that I actually really love their roster and I love what they're, you know, trying to do, um, you know, may take a couple more years to get, you know, a couple more big pieces for them, but, um, I think they'll put up a respectable matchup, but I'll ultimately, you know, pick the yeah. Wolves taking the eight seed. Yep. I agree. So I guess, um, you know, I'm trying to look at our scenarios here. Um, so it feels like we're pretty much locked. Then we have the Clippers at seven and the wolves flipping, you know, to the eight seed there. So mm-hmm. if we're just going to go down the line with how it's currently ranked, uh, you know, the first matchup I'll look at is the, the one seed Phoenix suns, um, facing the wolves. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's pretty exciting. I think both it's it would definitely be a nice scoring, uh, scoring, uh, uh, competition in game and everything there. So, um, great to see a lot of the young talent kind of uh, competing against each other, but yeah, gotta go with the Suns here. Uh, I mean, I don't know what else to say. They're, they're, they're playing like the best team in, in the NBA right now. So, uh, I, I just don't see, I think defense, like I mentioned before, their uh, sons just have a lot better defense. They know how to u- utilize their length. Um, so I, I just th- see them slowing down the Timberwolves offense, uh, which is, you know, I think they were number ranked number one in pace. Uh, and I think like top five overall in terms of offense, but then their defensive rating was like 20 something. So, you know, just not, just not up to par for a team like the Suns. So yeah, I got to go with the Suns here. Yeah, this is a, a no-brainer for me. I mean, the more time that goes by in this season and throughout this year, the more I'm starting to love the Suns. And yeah. <laughs> it, it's it's hard not to when, you know, you just look across the line and they've got, you know, the best record against teams of 500 records or better. Mm-hmm. they got the best plus minus in the league. Uh, they're the best team in 10-point games, so they're they're blowing teams out. And they have the best home and, and a really strong away record uh, to boot. And it's just like... 
you look down that line, I mean, Mikael Bridges, um, DeAndre, DeAndre Ayton, they're legitimate third pieces for a championship team. I mean, yeah. it's their year to kind of break out and show, you know, I can be the Chris Middleton or I can be the Drew Holiday for this year and, you know, really carry our team to the next, uh, you know, step, which they were right there last year. They were so close. And it's like, I think they're going to come out like gangbusters in that first round. I mean, I don't even think, uh, you know, wolves need to be covered in this sense. I'm just going to really say, I think it's going to be either a sun sweep or it's going to be five games. Yeah, no, if they pull out one, I think that's a good, I guess, moral victory for the Timberwolves. But yeah, like you were saying, uh, I think the Suns are playing with a chip on their shoulder. Um, you know, part of me also is kind of cheering for Chris Paul just to win one. You know, the NBA really screwed him over with the that LA trade, the LA Lakers trade, right? That that could have been that um, was blocked. Of course, now it's like that's that was the trade, like that was what got blocked. Uh, you know, especially with these days and everything. So, right, um, yeah, I just don't see the Timberwolves uh, really competing too much there. So, yeah, I mean, ditto on Chris Paul. I, he's like a Steve Nash character in a way where it's just like, man, this guy's been so good and, and so good for the game and has really made, you know, teammates look better. I mean, his time in Houston with James Harden, I always felt like, Oh, Chris Paul's the scapegoat. You know, Chris Paul's the reason why they're not getting over the hump. And then, you know, it goes to the thunder and he becomes uh, just an absolute floor general uh, franchise leader and just brings them to, you know, playoff contention. They really showed up in the, in the bubble. And it's like, since then, you know, he's carried the Suns to another, you know, stratosphere. It's like the Suns were complete, you know, completely uh, forgettable, a complete disaster of a franchise before he got there. And it's just like the light switch just went on and it's like Chris Paul just took the floor and, and really, I think probably made Devin Booker, you know, Aton, uh, Bridges. I mean, probably took those guys and really, you know, taught them what it's like to be, you know, a, a star and a pro in this league. For sure. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, you know, jumping down to the two versus seven seed, um, we've got the Memphis Grizzlies uh, who will play the Los Angeles Clippers. Yeah, no, this is a great matchup. Uh, Again, though, uh, Clippers don't have Kawhi Leonard. And I think that's that's the key thing for at least this series, uh, I'd say. Uh, Grizzlies, man, uh, one of the top scoring teams out there, but also really solid on defense. Um, definitely young. I think that's the one, like maybe knock on them, but you know, s- sounds like uh, John Morant's going to be back and healthy. Um, and you know, with the team that they have, they just have you know, they have a lot of depth uh, with regards to scoring. Uh, they know how to uh, you know pace everything. Uh, they play within control. Um, you know, Desmond Bain. Uh, I love watching him play. Like he's maybe like a quasi shorter, like Chris Milton, if you will. Um, you know, maybe just better three. I think you shot like 42% or something like that. And three with the pretty good, um, I think like maybe like seven, seven or eight shots a game. So really, really good in three ball. Um, so I, I, I just think the Grizzlies have too much firepower here. Um, that being said, again, if playoff P shows up, this, this it could make something interesting. Um, you know, especially with their length and their defense that the Clippers have uh to help maybe slow down that offense and then you know help neutralize John Moran a little bit you know if you're gonna get beat if I'm the Clippers if like if I'm if I'm gonna get beat it's not gonna be by John Morant right I'm gonna let you know some of these other players try to uh beat me I'm gonna try to let Brandon Clark beat me or something like that right um but uh I just think the Grizzlies have too much firepower had a great season great chemistry overall so my pick is uh with the Grizzlies for this yeah I um I'm with you. I don't think this is going to be just a, a shoe in of a number two seed knocking off a seven yeah. seed because, you know, as far as playoff experience go, you know, the, the script is absolutely flipped at this point. Um, you know, Clippers walk in as the kind of the dark horse and, you know, a team everyone's going to forget about. And for the Grizzlies, this is really their first time at the dance. It's mm-hmm. like, uh, you know, that's going to bring a lot of, you know, added pressure and nerves for a guy like John Moran. I don't think that he just walks in and dominates yeah. and, and maybe he will, I don't know, but, uh, I kind of just see it as like you're saying, we got Paul George, uh, you know, they got a pretty deep uh, array of uh, roster pieces there. I mean, even Amir uh, coffee, you know, I think right. he 30 the other night, it's just like, they're going to come at you from all angles. Um, I think the one thing that helps Memphis is obviously home court advantage, but um, you know, they've got some good bench pieces as well. I mean, I feel like they match up pretty well with, with guys that can, um, you know, play in the second unit They bring in, you know, DeAnthony Melton, they can bring in, you know, Tyler Anderson and, um, you know, kind of go along with a really nice starting five. Um, 
But I'm going to stick with you. I think that this one will go about six games. Yeah. And I'll stick with the Grizzlies. Yeah, I think I'm about six. Maybe it is a seven-game series, uh, but I'm thinking I'm looking at a six-game series. Uh, again, like we mentioned, just the playoff experience that the Clippers have. Um, and, you know, they have a lot of just good two-way players in general. So, you know, uh, if they had a Kawhi Leonard, you yeah, had this thing would be definitely different. Uh, if they had, you know, him for maybe like a month and then they kind of, you know, squatted into the playoffs, this would definitely be a different type of matchup. But, you know, he's really is the X factor with regards to this. Um, and yeah, maybe if the Clippers had a, like, I think Luke Kennard healthy too, uh, that adds a little bit more offense, uh, you know, that sometimes that they were kind of lacking in, in certain, in certain instances, but, um, yeah, uh, like you said, I think the Grizzlies, I think they'll, they'll, they'll get out of this round for sure, but, um, you know, it, 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 it won't be easy kind of like, uh, it won't be as easy as say like what the Suns are doing, uh, potentially to, uh, the Timberwolves. So. Yeah. Now, what if uh, what if Kawhi just happens to uh... <laughs> <laughs> what rafters? Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, kind of <laughs> into the, you know, into the hardwood. But uh, but honestly speaking, like, what if uh, the Clippers just threw caution to the wind a little bit and said, okay, we we heard from Kawhi, um, he'll be back. We're gonna have to limit his minutes, but uh, he'll be on the floor. We'll give you know give him 10, 15 minutes a game. Does that? Does that change, you know, does that, does that buy him a victory or anything? Or, or like, what do you think that impact could be? Oh man. I mean, like, I don't, I don't know if he's like, that's just like, like, I think some people operate like sometimes at like how it's, it is like an NBA live or NBA or NBA 2K, I should say. Nobody plays NBA, like, NBA 2K or like Madden, right? Like you just stick in a player in there and, they, and then they just function. Right. Um, you know, in the real world, right, it takes some time for you to kind of get get your rhythm going, warm up, get into playing shape, get into playoff shape too. So, um, yeah, like he's he's kind of played hurt before, uh, you know, in previous playoffs, but um, I just don't see it. Uh, I'd love to see it, but I I, I don't know. I <laughs> that would be that would be crazy if he did. But yeah, I with the healthy Grizzly squad, uh, yeah, it, it'll be hard to compete, but. That would be a fun thing to happen, though. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Um, one could only hope that he shows up. But, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in general, uh, I think we're both in agreement there. Um, let's jump over to uh, our, our favorite team in the West, the uh, Golden State Warriors. Uh, <laughs> taking on one of your favorite teams, uh, at least in the last couple of episodes, you've mentioned the Denver Nuggets. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. No, yeah, it's definitely – Man, if the Nuggets just didn't have so many damn injuries, uh, this 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 might be a better series. I it's it's been interesting because I've seen like Jokic just has, has been playing out of his mind like for the past month or two, or I mean, really this whole season, but especially the past month or two, kind of just like trying to make uh, a push for the Nuggets for playoff position, uh, just in general. But you know they don't have Porter, they don't have Jamal Murray. They've done they've done a decent job without both of them. Um, but you know, when you're going against the top teams, uh, say like, yeah, like the warriors, even though they don't have someone like, you know, even though they don't have a wise man, right. Uh, playing, um, you know, to help out guard, uh, Nikola Jokic. Um, I think this, this will be a fun series. I think that for sure is safe to say, but, uh, people for, keep on forgetting warriors have the top ring defense in the NBA, uh, in terms of efficiency, so, you know, they'll know how to stop uh, Jokic with Draymond and Looney kind of in the inside. Um, and then the perimeter players as well uh, being able to defend. So I have to go with the Warriors here. But, man, you know, I really like the way that, you know, the Nuggets are, are constructed. Uh, it's just they kind of hit the injury bug. And that, that I think that kind of limits their ceiling overall, uh, and especially against a team like the Warriors who – you know, are starting to get healthy. Uh, you know, it, it's, it sounds like Steph Curry may or may not play at least the first game, but uh, probably will play like maybe the rest of the games in the series. So uh, if that's the case, maybe the, the Nuggets, you know, pull out a game or two. Uh, but I think in the end, I think the Warriors uh, will prevail. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, <clears throat> I mean, you, you've pretty much covered what I feel about the Denver Nuggets. I mean, they kind of remind me of uh, today's New York Mets as far as, you know, they have <laughs> – <laughs> they've got some names you're just like god if only jacob de grom and max scherzer could just be healthy right. like what a great team this is and it's like it's unfair as a fan because you're just like 
I'd love to see Jokic, Murray, and Porter show up with their guys because there's still guys on that team. Monte, Mur- you know, Morris yeah. and, you know, um, you know, Aaron Gordon. And, you know, they've got some other guys that are our true NBA players. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like, I just love to see them square off against the Warriors because, I mean, like you're saying with Curry, he's hobbled and, you know, it, it, he'll come back. But in the same sense, if I'm like Golden State Warriors, I'm thinking, you know, let's let's take it easy almost on Steph because I don't want to say it's like in the bag, but in the same sense, if you've got, you know, eight guys you can pull from that, mm-hmm. you know, can bring a ton of energy. You've got Draymond Clay could, you know, carry the, you know, carry the you know workload as it is, but you, you know, fill in Jordan Poole and, you know, Damian Lee and you've got, um, you know, Kuminga and, and Moody and, and some of their youth. It's kind of like they've just got so many different pieces and parts and, it's almost like they could defend their way to a first round victory um, in that sense. And, you know, they still got some, some offensive fire, firepower to boot. So it's just, uh, you know, I'm going to go with you here. I think, I think it's going to be warriors and, and I'll call it five. Um, again, I, I'd like to say more just because of Jokic and, and kind of how great of a bat, you know, basketball player he is from a passing perspective and just, you know, scoring rebounding, just, he does it all. Um, he's a pleasure to watch, but, yeah, I got Warriors in five. Yeah. Yeah, no, it is. I don't say, I mean, I guess it's kind of sad and all that. You, you always want to watch like the top players play and, you know, not be on the sidelines for this. So, um, but yeah, like a full healthy nuggets, this would be an awesome series, but you know, in this case, yeah, it, 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 it would be something if uh, the nuggets can, you know, maybe score a game or two uh, maybe in the beginning. So, but yeah, you bring up a good point though, is if, the Warriors are able to beat the Nuggets, like maybe for their first two games, it's like, do they just like Curry chill a little bit? Right. So, you know, that can definitely be something that's uh, maybe talked about in their own little circles, but um, yeah, it's hard to kind of go against the Warriors and their firepower and they're also their defensive prowess uh, against Jokic and kind of just centralizing him and be like, let anybody else beat you, but not Jokic. So, yeah. And gotcha. And the last matchup we have here is the four or five seeds. Um, we got the Dallas Mavericks against the Utah Jazz. Uh, how do you feel about that one? Yeah, no, this is actually, uh, I, I, I thought this might be actually be a little bit closer, but at least from my, I guess, research that I was kind of doing and really analyzing the teams and how they were playing, uh, maybe more so down the stretch. Um, you know, I am, I, I am going to go with the Mavericks. Um, I think, the Mavericks, ever since that trade with uh, Porzingis, right, when they got rid of Porzingis, um, uh, they're, I think they're a better team, <laughs> it seems like. Um, they've won, what, I think 17 of their last, I think 22 games, it looks like. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think with regards to that, it was just, you know, actually Porzingis, I've seen his, uh, his stat line, I think, with uh, the Washington Wizards. He's actually playing better uh, as a wizard overall, um, just, you know, scoring more points, more efficient and all that. Um, I just, I think with the Mavericks and how they're built, you know, kind of around uh, Luca is just, uh, they're more so the big men. They're just about like, you know, screen and pop, screen and pop. So uh, we're presenting us something wants to do a little bit more on the ball. So, um, you know, yeah, I, I think in the end for them, analyzing that trade in the long term, it seems like at least that, um, you know, kind of worked out for both of them. But Mavericks seem to be playing a lot better. Jazz uh, kind of had a little bit of an injury bug here and there. Um, there's just seems like there's a lot of talk in the inward circles of like, this might be the last year. It was like Donovan is probably going to be gone. Um, so if that's the case, then, you know, this might be kind of their swan, swan song, if you will. Um, you know, it, it is, I think they have, uh, um, uh, Bojan Boganovic and then a uh, white side coming back to help out with some depth there. But, you know, like I said, I think the Mavericks are playing really, really well, uh, in the past couple months. So I'm going to pick the Mavericks here. I mean, that's fair. And, and, you know, looking at the momentum, I mean, I think definitely think that gives them a, a pretty good leg up or just like a, you know, good boost going into the playoffs. Um, I'm actually going to take the Jazz. Uh, I, I, I just, it's hard for me to look at both rosters and think that even, you know, momentum aside that the Mavs are going to match up, you know, cleanly with the Jazz. I, you know, kind of look at Doncic. Obviously he's like the next, uh, 
kind of coming, I, I feel like, of a LeBron James type, just with what he can do with the ball, his ability to shoot, his ability to pass. I mean, he's just kind of, uh, you know, a, a star that's already, you know, come out. He's already been a star in the making upon entering the NBA. It's just like, you know, I'd love to see him win a series. That'd be that'd be fun to watch. I just feel like he's surrounded by, like, fourth wheels on a championship team. <laughs> yeah, like, for sure. Here, here's Doncic and, you know, uh, you know, the, the rest of the guys. They kind of um, – in a way they kind of remind me of a young, you know, Cleveland Cavaliers team when LeBron first entered the league and, you know, year after year would take him to the playoffs, you know, to get to the Eastern conference finals, you know, uh, the semis, they get blown out in the finals. It's like, um, you know, we're still yet to see if Doncic can, um, you know, take, take a team far in the playoffs in the same sense. I'm kind of like, you know, if Jalen Brunson's your two or, Right. Yeah, maybe it's Finney Smith is your second option. I, I just take the team that's, you know, Donovan Mitchell, Rudy Gobert, uh, Jordan Clarkson, uh, Bojanovic. It's like, and they've been there and they've done it. Um, you know, they've won big series. They've, they've pushed up against, you know, um, you know, other teams in the West. They were the one seed last year. And, and you know, they did take a step back. And, and, I, and I agree with you. There's been the rumblings of, uh, you know, Mitchell and Gobert's beef and, you know, just, just how much Mitchell wants to stay in Utah. I mean, if I was uh, in my young twenties and <laughs> I was out in Salt Lake city, I'd, I'd probably be like, man, I, you know, Los Angeles sounds pretty good right now, or you know, New York would be kind of cool, but um, that'd be kind of a shame. You know, I, I always get kind of a little wave of sadness when people leave Utah. I don't know why I don't really care about the jazz, but like, <laughs> I, I still am like, you know, it's cool when Deron Williams was, uh, you know, the yeah. main guy in, in Utah. And it was, it was nice to see Gordon Hayward become like, you know, uh, you know, the next uh, son of, of Utah in the same sense. It was like, I, I feel like that, that whole state embraced him as their star. And, you know, when he left it, it kind of, I don't want to say derailed his career because he had some injuries, but it kind of just feels like, um, you know, if Mitchell could just embrace that situation and maybe attract another, you know, marquee star, we won't be just talking about, you know, first round battle um, at the four and five seeds. It's like that team could be on the doorstep. But um, yeah. well, what do you think of that um, that pick and, and just my analysis overall, I guess, of Utah and that whole situation or Dallas? Yeah. Well, yeah. No, t- t- to your point, though. Yeah, I-, I agree that the Mavericks, like, who are these guys? Like, they're not first round picks or anything like that. Uh, but for some reason, they work. And, you know, um yeah, like they don't have star powers, but I, I think that's the idea with uh, uh, Luca is he's able to uh, kind of help create for the team some. Um, and, you know, yeah, Jalen Brunson, like uh, he he has a kind of emerged as like a decent point guard in, in today's NBA and able to score and kind of create his own shots. So, yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, I also just, I think for the Jazz, I'm like, why did you, why did you get rid of Joe Inglis? Like why? <laughs> <laughs> he was like to me, he was the face of the franchise. Like <laughs> I think he's still crying uh, in Portland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, but no, I, I can definitely see that. I think for me as a, like as a fan of basketball and, and as someone that also wants to see Luca succeed too. Like I'd rather him not be like you know, like a Tracy McGrady, right? Like really, really great, you know, stat line, offensive prowess, like killing the uh, regular season, but, um, you know, not being able to get out of the first round. Uh, And yeah, you know, if they're able to put things together, great uh, overall. But, um, you know, to your point though, I I think it may, it does make sense. I think with regards to the jazz, uh, you know, with Rudy uh, probably up for another defensive player of the year. Uh, and then, yeah, the formula of having uh, Jordan Clarkson just kind of, uh, you know, filling up the stat sheet, scoring uh, off the as a six man. Um, and then Donovan Mitchell, you know, if he can play kind of like how he did in the bu- bubble too, uh, it's always hard to beat that. So, um, no, I mean, it makes sense for sure. Uh, I just disagree. So that's all. <laughs> but if there is, a, yeah, I, I, it's definitely a good four or five matchup overall. But um, yeah, I think uh, I think the Mavs uh, are this could probably be like a seven game series, but I think the Mavs will take it in the end. So too much Luca magic. Yeah. I'm with you as far as um, how, how deep this, you know, series goes. I definitely see this as a seven game set. Um, I don't think this will walk in the park for the jazz um, whatsoever. And uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I'm just looking forward to some good basketball here. I mean, it feels like, you know, the West is is going to be pretty tough. I mean, East is is pretty much uh, looking pretty top heavy with, you know, with the exception of the Nets. But um, mm-hmm. I don't know, do you have any other thoughts, um, you know, for this Western Conference setup or, you know, yeah. um, any of the teams and players involved? Yeah, I mean, I think I, it's pretty exciting. I think that there's some new blood in the Western Conference. You know, it used to be like KD... Uh, just talking about him when he was like, you know, with uh, Oklahoma City Thunder and also like Russell Westbrook and all that. Obviously, those things are, are a little bit shifted with KD now in the East and then uh, Westbrook, you know, with the kind of downtrodden Lakers and all. Um, so it's it's nice to see some fresh faces with the Timberwolves, with uh, with the Grizzlies. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm excited for uh, playoff basketball, um, you know, and you know, it, it's, it's definitely made me think, I think kind of going through this, like, are the Warriors the best pick? I mean, those Suns are really, really killing it, but um, excited to see that matchup come along for sure. Um, and, and seeing who comes out of the West. So yeah. How about you? What are your thoughts on kind of overall Western playoffs, Western conference playoffs? And yeah. Are there any players that you're excited to see? I mean, I am just going to echo your sentiments with the Suns because you and I have both been, you know, it's easy to be a Warriors fan. It's so easy. <laughs> so good, and they've been so good for so long. And, uh, you know, Steph Curry was on my top 10 favorite list the other day. And yeah. we just posted that episode. So if you have a top 10 favorite player, you know, go on over to YouTube and tell us who yours is. But, uh, no, it's it's honestly, um, as I'm thinking about this and as we're getting deeper into it, and I, and I don't like to flip-flop. So I when I <laughs> pick something, I, I usually tend to stick to it. But, uh uh, man, it's just getting harder and harder when I look at the Suns, and I'm just like, yeah. they have no holes. They have no yeah, holes, holes, and 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 they have no concerns. And yeah, and they're healthy. It, yeah, they're healthy. You know. It's, yeah, it, it, it <laughs> kind of feels like their time. And um, yeah. you know, apart from that thought and what you said, um, the only other thought I have about you know the Western Conference overall is just how happy I am that the Lakers are not in the playoffs. I mean, yes. <laughs> I just there's something so funny like I heard today LeBron um actually is like denying that he wanted Westbrook and like denying that he was a part. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's like a separate rumor that like LeBron is uh enthused by the potential of Mark Jackson signing as the next Lakers coach oh, and I'm just like I'm just thinking to myself, like, you're enthused or, you know, the press conference is tomorrow because we all know you run that franchise. We know you run every franchise you go to. Yeah. And it's just, um, it's just nice, like you said, to see a brand new set of teams. We're moving into a new era of basketball. Um, don't get me wrong. I love everything that, you know, LeBron's contributed to the game. But in the same sense, um, I don't like rooting for him. And I don't like rooting for the you know, manufactured teams he puts together. So, um this will be exciting. And I think there's, you know, whoever takes it is going to be a fun team to watch in the finals. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Maybe the Suns. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Don't say it. But uh, I think that's a wrap um, as far as this episode goes. If you, you know, if you have anything else to say, you know, speak now, forever hold your peace. But um, yeah. I mean, hey, uh, yeah. Share us your, your thoughts, you know, tweet at us or, uh, comment on Instagram. Uh, who do you think, uh, you know, do, do our picks suck? Do you want to, or do you think the Suns will actually take it? Like, let us know, tweet us, uh, or post on Instagram. Um, you know, feel free to let us know. And then, yeah, I think, uh, that's, that's a wrap here. All right. Sounds good, Wayne. Uh, that's Wayne Poir. I'm Patrick Miller. We're signing off for the ball and breakfast podcast. Uh, have a good day.